Thank you very much for waiting. Uh, we will now uh, proceed uh, to the keynote uh, address. Uh, keynote address number one uh, will be uh, given uh, by Professor Timothy Modern of uh, Rice University. Uh, his topic uh, will be hypercities. Uh, Professor Morton, please, please give him a big round of applause. Hello, everybody. I'm Tim. Um, I am a citizen of the two most embarrassing countries in the world, USA and Britain. So, yeah, hooray. Thank you for laughing. Um, so, uh, the, the recent tidal wave that hit Indonesia was a really terrible one. It made me think about where I had been to Singapore last year and how I met many people who were working in Indonesia and told me things about the cities there. I don't know much as, as some people about the geography of, of, of Indonesia in particular, but I understand something about the cities there. On Java in particular, they can reach all the way up to the volcanoes. They go everywhere. That's where I got the idea of a hyper city, a city that's even larger than a mega city and which, though physically large, is strangely smaller in, a, in another way, in, in a, uh, since the massive distribution makes it less different from other places which might well be joined to it, less iconic, less self-contained. I thought that was very interesting. A few years ago, I invented this word hyperobject, and this is the this is the hyperobject suit. Actually, this is the Abasi Rosobero designed it in New York City, and they you, you can buy it and everything. I'm I'm just like a model for them now, and thank you for almost laughing. Um, <laughs> keep doing it; it's very good for my ego. Um, I first wrote this word hyperobject in 2008, and um, when I was writing a book called The Ecological Thought. Hyper, of course, means beyond in, in, in Greek. Object is a little bit harder to talk about. That's because I don't mean it in anything like the sense that is meant in modern philosophy, that is philosophy in the lineage of, of Kant and Hegel. That's because in those systems, there is an object and there's a subject. Um, the subject could be all kinds of things. For Kant, the subject is what he calls the transcendental subject. For Hegel, the subject, or as I am now calling it, the decider, um, is what he calls Geist, G-E-I-S-T, the spirit of history. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment, so, so hold that thought, as they say. The subject-object dualism goes back to Descartes with his ideas of the res intellectus, the, the, the intellectual thing, the thinking thing, and the res extensa, the extended stuff, whatever that is. Kant claimed to be doing much better than Descartes by not smuggling in what he calls ontology. By ontology, Kant means unfounded assertions about reality dating from Christian theology, in particular Neoplatonic uh, Christian theology. But the dualism goes back further in philosophy than Descartes. Descartes claims that he's going beyond what he calls scholasticism, by which is meant the sort of medieval philosophy that he doesn't like. You know, it's sort of like, you know, a word for, for ideas you don't like, you know. Um, but secretly, he isn't going beyond it at all. So we have a funny, peculiar situation here. We have philosophers who claim to be modern, that is, philosophers who claim to be going beyond unfounded assumptions and concepts, medieval scholasticism, and the word ontology, which for them is a dirty word. On the other hand, we have philosophers secretly using that stuff anyway. What are we going to do? It's not difficult. You just have to forget the initial idea that there is a thing called a subject, which is somehow different from the thing called an object. In other words, you have to think about what I do, um, which is called object-oriented ontology. Object-oriented ontology says that for a thing to exist, it must exist in the same way as something else. If there really are things called sentences, then they exist in the same way as cats, if there really are cats. I'm not going to insist that there really are cats right now. That might be more of a scientist's job anyway. But the point is, a tree, a pencil, Tim, a cat, a lecture, an idea about a cat, all exist in the same way. And how do they exist? They exist by having a, a radical difference between what they are and how they appear. They, how they appear means um, 
how they sort of get used by other things. You can look at a wall, climb up it, fire a gun at it, ignore it, write a poem about it, or use it as an example in a lecture in Tokyo. The point is, when you look at a wall, you, you have a wall glimpse. When you climb a wall, you have a wall climb. When you fire a gun at a wall, you have a wall bullet hole. What you totally don't have is the wall itself. Thanks to Aristotle, you don't have to care so much about things. Since the essence um, of Greece, for example, is in its form, you see, this is what Aristotle likes to say, that the essence of things is their form, and also in what it's for, and since it's made of um, lots of different types of people, for example, and um, how it works, some kind of very limited democracy, let's say, aren't as important as what its form is and what it's for, you've just given Alexander the Great all the conceptual tools he needs to justify invading lots of land to the east and enslaving people, or turning them into Greek people. Aristotle supplies you with a sort of civilization in a box that you can unpack and unleash any way you like. It doesn't matter that where you landed is made of sand or subtropical savanna or swamp. You can pitch your Greekness there, no problem. What it's for and what it looks like can just pop out out of the handy philosophical box that Aristotle gave you. You know, so like Greeks are invading barbarians and enslaving them, and barbarians are being enslaved. It's very convenient, right? Kant gives you another upgraded reason. Um, uh, why um, something like a cat might be as good as, as a piece of paper for, for writing a poem on. Like, he doesn't care about things either. And that's for a strange, different reason. Namely, that the cat in question is, is in fact, more like a piece of paper than a, than a cat. The trouble is that, that Kant is fiendishly half right, and easier to accept than the seemingly superficially easier Aristotle. That's because, whereas it would take a lot of fancy theology to prove um, what Aristotle wants you to think about, namely the existence of substances that remain constant if their form remains constant, underneath certain appearances called accidents designated as superfluous, right? So Tim stays being Tim even if he completely changes his, his appearance. Um, Kant makes it much easier insofar as he points out that, that every time you reach for a thing, say it's some kind of yellow brick, in the wall that I just mentioned. No matter how you reach for it, you, you won't be able to access the actual brick in itself. You're going to access brick data, which for sure is about bricks, but brick data isn't bricks, it's data. And he lets slip, though he tries to make sure you don't notice that this happens no matter what your access mode is. Officially, Kant holds that, that, that thinking is the top access mode, and that somehow the thinking, that is the transcendental subject, gets to make the brick real, or realize it like a director or a producer making a movie, or a conductor interpreting a piece of music, or like reading a poem, bringing the squiggles to life as a poem. The trouble is you have to do a lot of fancy metaphysical, nay theological footwork in that direction if you're going to go along with Kant as opposed to Aristotle. No, the easy bit is, and, and, and Kant actually gives it away in, in an example, which is why he was scared of using them, is that no access mode whatsoever will be able to wrap itself around the whole of that brick in the best or almost proper way. You can think about the brick, that will give you brick thoughts. You can lick the brick, that will give you brick licks. This now starts to sound a bit like Dr. Seuss, if you've ever read Dr. Seuss. You know, Luke, Lark, Licks, Lakes, you know. You can brush the brick, that'll obtain brick brushings. You can interview the brick, this will give you a brick interview, presuming that bricks can talk, you know, like Muppet Show brick, you know. Um, which won't be very verbose either. You can ignore the brick, this will give you a fuzzy cloud of brick-shaped ignorance. You can put the brick in your building, this will give you a brick building. See the trouble? One of the cool things about the trouble is that any access mode at all is equally rubbish at, at Pac-Manning the brick once and for all. And this means that non-human beings, from flies who land on the brick, to bacteria that digest the brick, to Pac-Man that eats the brick in an example about object-oriented ontology in a lecture, 
are equally as good or bad at grasping the brickness as thinking, which anthropocentrism, which is you know believing that humans are special and different in a better way than, than everything else, bless it, has tended to confine to just one corner of the universe, aka the one where we're at, surprise, surprise, the, 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 the humans. Like, we get to make stuff real, everything else is like a kind of blank screen, yeah? Okay, that's the cool bit, because if licking things is just as good as thinking about them, then cats are just as good as humans, right? Or snails, yeah? And now for the uncool bit, the bit that, that the OOO, the object-oriented ontology, is, is rejecting. Um, so remember that, that, that we, OOO is okay with the brick being inaccessible in some way, prof in a profound way, but it's not cool with the anthropocentric workaround that I was just sketching, whereas thinking, whereby thinking becomes the right way of accessing the brick. One reason for this is, is that how Kant has been interpreted feels uh, has been like someone with partial hearing um, at a mixing desk. This person has two faders to control. One fader is the correlator fader, the entity that gets to do the accessing. The other fader is the correlatee fader, the brick in this case. Traditionally, on the Kantian mixing desk, only one fader has been turned up anywhere near loud, the right channel, the correlator fader. The correlatee fader has tended to be turned way, way down. This enhances a sense of human power. Hegel goes so far as to get rid of the left channel altogether. It's like somehow he thinks that a really cool mono remix of Kant would be better than the original stereo. The point being that since this inaccessibility of the brick in itself is an idea in the thought stream of the transcendental subject, it's not always true, it's just an idea. So there's no real inaccessibility, because the brick isn't even a brick at all until the subject has posited it as such. Hooray! Problem solved. We've eliminated the distortion in the mix by breaking the mixing desk, by getting rid of the correlatee fader altogether. It was turned way down in any case. Who's going to miss it? Dot, 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 global warming. And the net effect of this is that the brick itself isn't really a brick at all. It's a cinema screen or, or, or a monitor on which can be projected whatever ontological format the correlator wishes, the lovely, benevolent human being who has everybody else's best interests at heart. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the inner ontological structure of, of a hyperobject, that is, um, uh, a thing that's distributed so vastly in space and time that you can only like point to little bits of it at once, even if you're a very powerful supercomputer. It's very hard to map climate change in real time, for example. To be a hyperobject, you have to have a gap at every point between what you are and how you appear. Actually, that's the case regarding any object at all, but it's especially clear with a hyperobject. And to be a hyperobject, there has to be more inside of you than there is of you. Actually, that's true of any object again, but it's really obvious with a hyperobject. So what we're going for here is is a new kind of holism, you know, because I think if you're going to think in an ecological way, then you're going to have to be a holist. And the sort of traditional form of holism in the West isn't great at all. For, for this moment, right? Because it's saying that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, this truism is one of the most profound inhibitors of, of sharing our world with other life forms. This kind of holism is a symptom of, of agricultural age monotheism, and, and we're still retweeting it, even if we think we're atheists. The belief format is evident in, in the way in which something like Gestalt psychology is misheard to be repeating it. Gestalt psychology argues that the whole is different than the parts, not greater than. Yet this common misunderstanding persists among psychologists themselves. We must find some tools to dismantle it. Why not rewrite holism such that the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. I, I, I came up with this idea in an urban architecture um, class, and it's out, out of a feeling of despair, like I didn't quite know what to say, so I just found this coming out of my mouth, and then I start thinking about it. 
Let's call it subsendence, S-U-B-S-C-E-N-D-E-N-C-E, -E -E, like transcendence, but with like sub in front of it. We'll go about proving this by examining some features of this object-oriented ontology. Um, we should see things such as humankind, yeah, the, like the, the, the human species and so on, as wholes that are less than the sum of their parts. Tim Morton is so many more things than just human. A street full of people is so much more than just part of a greater whole called city. It's hard to locate contemporary megacities because we keep looking for something that totally incorporates its parts. Towns, villages, and other formations are strung together in Java in such a way that only the volcanoes on that massive island prevent them from spreading everywhere. The only limit is a perceived threat to life. The string of dwellings isn't even a megacity, it's, it's a hypercity, a city that's hardly a city at all. But precisely because of this less than a city quality, a hypercity is beyond even the colossal size we associate with megacities such as Mexico City. Java's hypercity is, is less than the sum of its parts. Parts of it, houses, regions of houses, keep on pouring out of it like ice cubes bursting through the paper bag that they made wet. Now that's an example of what you might call an accidental hypercity, and it's not that great. Later I'm going to give you a tiny example of a deliberate hypercity, which I think could be a great idea. Holes subsend their parts, which means that parts are not just mechanical components of a whole, um, that there can be genuine surprise and novelty in the world, that a different future is always possible. It's good to regard things um, such as capitalism, for example, as physical beings, not simply as fictions that would disappear if we just stopped believing in them. But what kind of physical beings are they? If they're subsendent, it means that we can change them if we want. What if some things could be physically huge, yet ontologically tiny? Ontologically means to do with how they exist, right? Like, not what they are, but how they exist, yeah? What if neoliberalism, for example, which envelops Earth in, in some kind of misery right now, were actually quite small in another way, and thus strangely easy to subvert? Too easy for intellectuals who want to make everything seem difficult so that they can keep themselves in a job by explaining it or outdo each other in competition. Sorry, I mentioned that I always say the wrong thing in public. Never say bad things in public, yeah. Um, you ever see that show, Curb Your Enthusiasm? I'm that, I'm that guy, yeah? Thank you for laughing, nervously. Um, or outdo each other in competition for whose picture of the world is more depressing. I am more intelligent than you because my picture of neoliberalism is far more terrifying and encompassing than yours. We are truly enslaved in my vision with no hope of escape, therefore I am superior to you. Isn't this a tragic consequence of, of what some people call cynical reason? The dominant way of being right for the last 200 years. To prove subsendence is also childishly simple, which makes the resistance you're going to feel towards it all the more significant. To show that the whole is less than the sum of its parts, all you need to do is accept that a group of things can also be a thing, which is a simple way of saying that if a thing exists, it exists in the same way as another thing. A sentence exists in the same way as a word processing program. A tree exists in the same way as a forest. An idea exists in the same way as a quasar. This is very far from saying that things have the same right to exist. Claiming that the AIDS virus has as much right to exist as an AIDS patient is a conclusion you can draw within the logic of deep ecology but it has nothing to do with actual ecological politics and everything to do with a Gaia hypothesis or, or concept of a biosphere that is greater than the sum of its parts in which every being is, is a replaceable component. This has to do with agricultural age religion, the ideological support of the social, psychic and philosophical machination that eventually generated mass extinction. I'm sorry to say that word. It's um, very frightening to me. I mean, I, I try not to call it climate change, I try to call it global warming because it's sort of really what it is, but what global warming really is is mass extinction and that's just so scary it's hard even to say it. So deep ecology is fighting fire with fire there. 
Very well then, a tree exists in the same way as a forest. The parts of the forest, the trees, but obviously there's so many more parts, right? Outnumber the whole. This doesn't mean are more important than the whole. This is the kind of anti-holist reductionism that um, neoliberalism promotes. You know, like Mrs. Thatcher says, there's no such thing as society, there are only individuals, yeah? We need holism, but a special, weak kind of holism that isn't theistic. Climate is ontologically smaller than weather. Weather is a symptom of climate. I mean, there's no point in even worrying whether global warming caused it, because it's all being caused by climate, right? But there's so much more to weather other than simply being a symptom of climate. A shower of rain is a bath for this bird. It's a spawning pond for these toads. It's this soft, delicate pattering on my arm. It's this thing I wrote some sentences about. Humankind is ontologically smaller than the humans who make it up. There is so much more that humans do other than be parts of humankind. Humans modify their bodies to change their gender and add electronic and decorative prostheses. Humans form relationships with non-humans. Humans contain non-humans, such as the bacterial microbiome, in such a way that if the non-humans left, the humans would die. This means that the correct concept of the human is of a sort of partial object in a set of partial objects, such that it comprises an implosive whole, like that, yeah? A whole that is less than the sum of its parts. This partiality extends in every dimension, including time. An event is a temporal partial object. An event is part of some set of events that comprises a whole, but this whole is always less than the sum of its parts. A battle in feudal Japan wasn't simply a matter of two lords fighting. Flies settled on the corpses. Five years later, delicate flowers bloomed. Evolution shuffled the decks in its million-year-long game of cards. To be a thing is to be a perforated bag full of water, in which are swimming countless little perforated bags of water, in which are floating... Dot, dot, dot. When you cut open a bag, so many more bags spill out that you could possibly have bargained for. This is how an emotional label, such as anger, is not, quite evidently, a whole that intuitively contains gradations and subtleties, all conveniently summed up by that one term. We may find within anger hesitation, a sense of humor, sexual passion, grief. This is equivalent to discovering that a physical line has a fractal dimensionality when you examine it more closely. A fractal is a partial number that goes wiggling around being just itself for a potential infinity of iterations. Beauty is a slightly disgusting or weird or fascinating in an ecological age, as, as was beginning to be discussed, because the human-scaled bag of, full of water that is inducing the beauty experience inevitably contains and is part of bags full of water at all kinds of non-human scales. Kitsch, for example, is, is subsendent beauty. Um, something that uh, a thinker called Georges Bataille calls general economy is a subsendent 12-inch remix of restricted economy. And what this means is that all the non-human economic modes are in the mix too, because economics is really just about how you organize your enjoyment. An ecological politics just means allowing and enhancing all kinds of enjoyment that isn't obviously to do with you. Well, that's not that it's nothing to do with you, that's too tight, it's just that you let yourself be perforated. So a being is a symbiotic community consisting of itself and a kind of weird extra bit, like, like, like the X-Men, you know, X, X-Men. A being is less than the sum of its parts. Kitsch is other people's enjoyment. In an ecological age, where there is no one true and proper scale, beauty will be appreciated along with its weird halo of, of, of disgust. This kind of beauty is, is X beauty, just like a life form is always an X life form. Um, now the beauty of all this is that we can start to look at all kinds of things through this kind of lens of, of thinking about hyper cities and hyper objects, discovering what qualities and so on, things that have go beyond the abilities of other things to encapsulate or grasp them. 
This is a fantastic way of thinking about cities in an ecological way, if you consider it. That's because there's so many non-human beings living in cities already, but cities hardly take account of, in, of them, except for trees and plants and so forth to some extent. I used to believe, for example, in the idea of the outside cat, the cat who you can let go outside. That was before two of my cats got run over. Then I realized that for a cat, outside isn't outside. It's a war zone. It's, it's the Iraq war for cats. The idea of an outside cat is just there to convince human me that there is an outside to human space, an idea that nowadays could be very, very risky because it implies we don't have to take responsibility for anything that is outside like that. The hyperobject concept is great because it's relative. You can apply it to the way cats live in cities. To an electron, a glass of water is a hyperobject. Now imagine all the things you can do with the concept of a hypercity. My architect friend, Tom Wiscombe, who teaches at SciArc in Los Angeles, has a great idea. How come we always think that the ground is under our feet? How come we can't imagine another whole city above our heads? It might make a lot of ecological sense. All that shade and all those services in a much larger hypercity structure. That's just an example. Now, I'm a philosopher, so my job isn't to tell you what to visualize or, or, or think as architects about hypercities. My job, rather, is to tell you how to think. I think that makes a pretty good synergy with any kind of practical aesthetic work, such as architecture. Thank you. <laughs>